reviewing, you know, we've been looking at the, the eight basic uh, parts of uh, our language, uh, parts of speech. And, and we looked at nouns, words that name thing, and verbs are the action words that do things. And, and basically here, a simple sentence will usually have, it's uh, three parts to it. It will have a noun, the subject, okay? So we have our subject here, God. And then going through a particular action, and the action verb right here is create, or created, past tense. And then we'll have what he worked on, or what he created, and here's the object of the verb. And here it is, the earth. And so... The subject is a noun, the object is a noun, and there's a verb. And, and you could probably make a whole bunch of sentences just with nouns and verbs. Now, nouns have cousins. So, so I have nouns. But they have a cousin known as pronouns. So if, I, if I've begun a paragraph with God created the earth and then I use the next sentence and he placed animals on it. The pronoun he is now taking the place of the subject noun God and representing God. So it's like a cousin. It's another way of representing the noun. He uh, placed, here comes the next verb, let's say animals on it. And here's the pronoun it representing the earth. And it's understood because I've stated the nouns in the first sentence. I'm just I'm trying to get us a walking through understanding of how languages work. Now, so we see nouns and pronouns are kind of related here. All right. Now, we're going to learn tonight, we're going to begin to learn how God begins to enrich the language by having words that are called adjectives. And they have cousins called adverbs. Just like the noun has cousins that are pronouns, the adjectives have uh, cousins that are called adverbs. So if you have the sheet that I gave you tonight, you will see that adjectives are words that describe. And what they do is they describe a noun or a pronoun. Or they will modify a noun or a pronoun. And then we'll see they have a cousin. The cousin is the adverb. And the adverb will also describe or modify, but rather than a noun, it will describe or modify a verb or another adjective. So they're kind of cousins one to another. So, so let's take a look at some um, adjectives as we might find them in, in the Bible. Uh, for example, uh, a, a real good one. Uh, Genesis uh, 17 and verse 1. And when Abram was ninety and nine years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, we see the noun God in the sentence. Now, notice how it's modified by the word that's before it. The Almighty God. We're, we're modifying the noun by putting this word Almighty in front of it. So now, again, I can change this sentence to the Almighty God created the earth. And you see how I've, I've taken the noun and I've given it another degree. I've, I've, I've modified it. I've described it in a different way. I've put a little bit more into there. I mean, I have a car in the parking lot. I have a red car in the parking lot. And I begin to describe the car a little bit more. I put some attribute to it through that word that changes, that, that, that adjective that begins to describe or modify the noun. See, the Almighty God 
created the earth. About 2,000 years from now, when you and I are up in the New Jerusalem, we'll be able to say a sentence like this, the Almighty God created the new earth. Hadn't happened yet. <laughs> I guess we could write it like this. God writes it like that because He writes the future as this was past, already done because He's going to do it. But you'll see now, here's another adjective I put in here. Which earth? Oh, the new earth. The new Jerusalem. And so we see adjectives beginning, they, they're put in front of nouns or pronouns, we'll see, and they modify the noun or the pronoun. They give description to the noun or the pronoun. Now, look at your sheet here. And, and there are many common adjectives as you go through the Bible. You know, we talk about uh, there are garments, but the priest wore beautiful garments. Um, the, there are uh, 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 one that uh, Luke likes to use all the time about the certainty of the words. He likes the word certain. Like a sure, like you can bet on it. There was a certain man. There was a certain priest. There was a certain town. And, and, and you know, Luke likes to use that particular adjective. Um, it's good to have conversation, but Peter says we should have chaste conversation. And so now the adjectives begin to modify these nouns. And, and when you become a teacher, you're going to look at these adjectives and want to go to the you know, dictionary and find out what is the Lord trying to... What does He mean by a chaste conversation? A conversation that's pure, that's uh, free from doctrinal error, that's uh, free from filth, uh, that type of a thing. That, that's uh, married to God and, and, and His holiness. And so then you'll be able to, in your explanation, go through and look at these adjectives, pull them out, and then, and then do some teaching to the people because we want to understand what the mind of God is on these things. Uh, it's good to have a countenance. It's better to have a cheerful countenance. God loves a giver, but you know what He really likes? A cheerful giver. And so now He begins to enrich His uh, sentences by putting adjectives in front of the nouns to modify and describe the particular noun. And so you want to keep your eye open for this when you're reading and look at the particular adjectives. Now, the position of adjectives, as you see here on your sheet. Um, and, I, and the grammarians have these big fancy words, but, but we'll use the simplicity. They'll talk about an attributive adjective, which is just basically before the noun, like the Almighty God like the new earth, like in Deuteronomy uh, 21 and verse 11. I'll give you a few examples there. You can maybe look them up on your own sometime. But, uh, and, and thou seest among the captives a, a beautiful woman. And, there, and there's the descriptive adjective beautiful before the word woman. And that's in the attributive, it's, it's before. And I think the other one I had was 1 Samuel 16, 12, where it talked about uh, David was of a beautiful countenance. There's also the time where the adjective will be placed after the noun. And usually when that happens, the, he'll use a linking verb. Let me give you an example because it'll make sense on your, your ear. Uh, go to uh, Genesis 29. For example, I just gave that one in Deuteronomy, when you see a, a beautiful woman. If you wanted to reverse the order of that and see the woman beautiful, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit all that well. But if you use a linking verb, the woman was beautiful, and you put the verb was in there. Or present tense, the woman is beautiful. Now the linking verb allows the adjective to come after the noun linked together with the noun. They call it the predicative because it's in the predicate position with, with a, a verb connected to it. Uh, go to Genesis, uh, where were we? Uh, 29 and uh, verse 17. Let me 
catch up with you there. Um, here, here. You see, Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And there's there's it linked together with the predicative, uh, it, with the linking verb. And often it's done that way. Now, now there are times occasionally where you'll find exceptions. So you just have to pay attention in your reading. Uh, you know, when in doubt as to what a particular word is, you, you have your your dictionary. That's why I, I recommend, you know, when you're studying your Bible, what are the three things you need? You need your Bible, first and foremost. You need a good concordance, like a strong concordance, so that you can link words together throughout the Scriptures. And then you need a good dictionary. A Noah Webster 1828 is a very good dictionary. Uh, Gail Ripplinger rec- rec- recommends that Oxford English Dictionary. Brother, uh, are you familiar with that one, Patrick? Uh, the yeah. Oxford? That's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, that's like 17 volumes or something. I heard it was long. very long. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary, the, the correct Oxford English Dictionary is like 17 volumes. They tell me it's like 1000 or $1,200 to buy if you want to get them all. But they say you can go... It's very large. It's incredibly large. It has etymologies going all the way back and all kinds of tracing of the words out. And, and they say that you can get it online. I had a guy that uh, went to church with us here for a while. Remember that? that, that Jim, Jim Johnson. That guy, that guy was a real student of the English language. And uh, he gave me the only facsimile copy I have of the uh, 1611 Bible which is very, very expensive. It was like an $800 Bible and he gave it to me as a gift. And he's done a lot of work tracing back the words and he has a copy of that Oxford English Dictionary. But he said there's a way to go online and access it somehow through the University of Toronto. And I can't remember if there's a price to do it or not. But I've always found the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary. You're familiar with it, right? Uh, that's a very good one. Noah Webster was a Christian, and you will observe that in his definition of words, he will often have a scriptural reference. And so that's good, using the Bible as his authority. And so when you're in doubt, you know, is this an adjective? But for example, go to Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11. And uh, again, we're talking about the Lord doing His work. Verse 10, I, I, He says, uh, I have seen uh, the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He, now do you see the pronoun? Mm-hmm. See, God was in verse 10. Now in 11, the pronoun He is referring to God back in verse 10. So, you, And we're going to look at this in the next couple of weeks as tracing pronouns in the English Bible. And that's uh, one of the great spiritual... Uh, tricks that you're going to have to be on your knees about. Uh, the Lord's going to teach you through the tracing of pronouns. It'll change the interpretation of a verse based on how you see it. But, but here it goes in verse 11. He, that's God, hath made everything beautiful in His time. Now, now watch this. Here's the adjective beautiful. Here it is following the noun thing, but it's not connected with a linking verb. There are times it will follow. Now, if you look at it carefully, the noun is thing. Look, look at the sentence. The noun is thing. And the the, the noun is modified two ways. Everything and beautiful. And, And notice why he does not connect every and thing and leaves them two separate words. Because the reference is every beautiful thing in its time. Not beautiful everything, because everything isn't beautiful, but every beautiful thing in its time. There are some things that are ugly, and God's going to destroy them and get rid of them. But there are things into which He's going to bring beauty. And, And even here on planet Earth, He hath made every beautiful thing in his time. And so here I just wanted to show you there are exceptions to when uh, the adjective coming after the noun will not always come after the noun with a linking verb, but usually it will. Usually it will. 
but sometimes it will come after without the linking verb. So you just got to pull back and think for a second. And this is where the Lord, you know, He really does require us to study. And, and the study of the language takes a little bit of gymnastics. There's a little bit of working out, you know, moving the words around and, and trying to fit these together in your mind and praying and asking for wisdom. If any man ask, uh, lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth liberally. Lord, on this particular uh, sentence I'm studying here, uh, how is the best way for me to understand this? And, and, he, and helps to move it around. But I just want you to know, it's not a hard and fast rule that every time the adjective comes after, there's not going to be a linking verb. Go to Romans 10 and verse 15. And the greatest thing that this has done for me is humble me in the study of this book. It just, this is God's language and, and it just requires, you know, prayerful, on your knees, meditation to, to try and get a, an understanding of, of how he's writing here. And you never mess with that word and you never change that word and you never alter that word. You revere that word, you fear that word, you love that word, and, and you, you just prayerfully meditate and, and, and study over it. Because God placed those words, they're all pure. This, this is how I see it. Like that young man yesterday from Scotland, the missionary that, that came and spoke to us. Did you see he was like-minded with us? He believed the King James Bible is inspired. That that was God working. I, I, I have to agree with him. That's the work of God. That's my God. I mean, think about it. Think about it. I have a corruptible body and it's fearfully and wonderfully made. And he intends to throw it aside one day and build a new one. This, this will not inherit heaven and earth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but this won't. You honestly think he didn't put more work in that than he did in this? You know, and I, I'm impressed with the DNA and the protein sequencing and everything in here, but it's something he's going to cast aside. This will endure forever. So, so, so here's his work. So Romans 10 and this, uh, verse uh, 15. And, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, now let's say the subject is feet. The feet of those that are going to go forth and carry forth the good news of the gospel. And God wants to speak about those feet and modify those feet and say what He thinks of those feet. They're not filthy feet. They're not dirty feet. They're not ordinary feet. They're not common feet. What are they? What are, what are they? God said they're beautiful. But notice how He did that there. Instead of putting it directly before the noun, He puts it in front of the verb to be are the feet. And so He links it in the front. And, and that just happens. So, that's a predicative form of the adjective, and yet it doesn't follow with a linking verb. It proceeds with a linking verb. My only point is this. There, God uses exceptions. God will not be uh, hard, fast bound by the rules of an English grammarian. See, what we're really learning here is what I'm beginning to see as I'm studying this thing out, and I'm reading the book by uh, you know a man that's a lawyer, and he's a grammarian, and this type of stuff. These are the, the constructs of man. This is, this is uh, English, uh, university English. All right? This is the king's English in this Bible here. It, it's beyond university English. It's the king's English. So, so again, it just, I want to show you, just you look and you say, okay, Lord, however you want to do it, that's fine. And... Uh, I'm just going to go slowly as I read through. Don't ever read through the Word of God like it's a, a dime store novel or, or a, a newspaper article, you know, where you skim it quickly. Um, uh, if, if you have accidentally put yourself on a Bible reading program where you've asked too much of yourself in a day, slow down. Cut your Bible reading program down. 
So if you can't get through it in a year, it takes two years, fine, then let it go two years. But you want to go through carefully through that word. You don't want to rush through it. You will miss a lot. I mean, I've slowed down my reading. And it's been better for me at a slower pace. I'm getting to see more of the richness and the fullness and the beauty, the preciousness of that word. So, so we see the positioning and we see there are exceptions to the positioning. So don't worry about it. I mean, just, just understand, sometimes it's going to come before, sometimes it'll come after. My, what I want to do is I want to get that noun and see how God wants to modify that noun and how he wants to describe that noun because that'll help me to get an understanding of how God thinks about this particular subject or this topic. And then I'll be able to teach it better, understand it better, express it better. Now, this is something you do want to know, the state. Adjectives have three states to them. The positive, the comparative, and the superlative. And uh, the positive is just the adjective in its raw state. It's, it's merely modifying the noun. A famous uh, verse of Proverbs 22, uh, verse 1, A good name is better to be chosen than great riches. Okay, now let's look at name. A good name. Not just an ordinary name, but a good name. So here, here the Lord's saying, I have this uh, subject, this noun name. And I would like my children to have a name. But I'd like to modify that name. I'd like it to be a good name. That's what I'd like for my children. I want them to have a good name. Now, he's talking about reputation. I understand that from a practical standpoint. From a doctrinal standpoint, there's none good but one. <laughs> That's the good name above all names. That's the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And a good name for you and I to choose is better than great riches. It's much better to choose Jesus than anything else. Amen. So I understand doctrinally. Okay? But practically, spiritually, he's talking about a reputation, a reputation that's good. A good name. Now that is the positive state of the adjective in its raw state. It's just taking name and it's saying, I want to uh, show you this name has a particular attribute to it. It's good. It's not bad. It's not ordinary. It's good. However, there's the comparative. And the comparative now is when an adjective compares two nouns. For example, go to 1 Kings chapter 1 and look at verse 47. And now, we don't just have a single name, we have two names in view, and we're going to compare them. And this is the time when David, after the attempt of um, Adonijah to usurp the throne from Solomon, David said, you go out and you consecrate my son, put him on the mule and bring him down there and anoint him and make him the king. And, uh, and they did that. And in verse 46, Solomon sitteth on the throne of the kingdom. Verse 47, And moreover, the king's servants came to bless our Lord King David, saying, God, make the name of Solomon better than thy name. So now we have a comparative. The, the servants are coming forth. And, they're, and what they're in their mind, what they're thinking, what they're praying, what they're hoping is, is God's now taken that the wonderful nation Israel, and he's established that kingdom, and he's established the throne of David, and their prayer is that that nation will grow in grace and in reputation, and that, and that 50 years down the line, when people look back, they'll say, wow, the, the kingdom under Solomon was better than the kingdom under David. There were more people, there was more holiness, there was more worship of the Lord. There was more wealth. There was a growth in the king. That was their prayer. That the name of Solomon would be better than the name of David. See, not just a good name. Now it's a better name. That's comparative. Comparative has to do with two items being compared. Now the last change there is notice. The superlative. And the superlative is when we're describing a group and we're looking at the utmost in that group. For example, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And again, you know the theme of the chapter. 
talking about spiritual gifts. And everybody's interested in spiritual gifts and there's all kinds of gifts, the prophecy and the discerning of spirits and uh, helps and the word of knowledge and all these gifts. And, and what does he say? Uh, verse 31, when you have all these groups compared one to another, covet earnestly the best gifts. And now within that group, there are, there are good gifts, there are better gifts, and there are the best gifts. And he'll you know, show you in the next two chapters. They're prophesying and charity. And those are the best gifts that you could ever have. Prophesying, speaking to men to edification, exhortation, and comfort, and doing it with a spirit of charity. And those are the best gifts. And if you have another gift, then doing that with charity. Any gift needs charity to modify it. Because if it doesn't have charity, you just make a mess of the gift. But you understand now, he's looking at a group, now he's looking at the best. So good, better, best. Positive, comparative, superlative. Now as a rule, when you have a particular adjective, uh, you, you can change it from its regular raw state to the comparative or superlative one of two ways. You either add ER or you take place the word more before the adjective. And so some examples will be found in the scriptures. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. And verse 16. And God made two great lights. All right. So, so I have lights. That was the noun subject I'm looking at there. And they are great. Not just ordinary lights. They're great lights. They're, they're better than these fluorescent bulbs we have right here. Okay. And these are pretty good ones. I, I just had these put in by an electrician a little while ago. These are new ballasts and new fixtures. But these two great lights are better than these bulbs. Okay. They're great lights God's talking about. And there's two of them. Now he's going to compare the two. And it says right there, and the greater light would rule the day. So, so I take the word great. There's that adjective in its raw state. I add the ER to it and it becomes the comparative form and it's now the greater. And as a rule of thumb, usually, if an adjective is a one-syllable adjective, as a rule of thumb you'll modify it by adding E-R or E-S-T. Uh, let's take a look at, um, where were we? Uh, Genesis chapter 3. Now, when an adjective gets more than one syllable, often it's difficult to add E-R, E-S-T. And so you'll use the word morph. So here we go. Now, the serpent was... Okay, he was subtle, this I know, but he was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. You put any beast next to that serpent and compare the subtlety of the two, the serpent is more subtle than any other beast that you can compare with one on one. Rather than saying the subtlest. Or, or subtler. In that case, the comparative would be subtler. Because that's the comparative form. And subtler doesn't work. So now here, there's another reason. Your ear becomes your guide on these questionable ones. I mean, uh, which one, uh, again, begins to sound better to the ear? Um, let's say, uh, this is a difficult class. And it is. <laughs> and uh, compared to... Ed's class, this is difficulter. It doesn't work. This is more difficult. All right. But, but this class, compared to Ed's class, and compared to what Brother Seth teaches, real nice and easy like, like I heard him this morning, this is the difficultest of all three teachings. 
No, it's the most difficult. And so then your ear is going to become your guide as to which way to modify. So we've seen, you can get to the comparative by E-R or M-O-R-E putting it in front. And remember, comparative compares just one against the other. Um, Bill is a, would it be more fast or faster runner than I? Faster. He's a faster runner than I. But you wouldn't say Bill is the faster runner of the three of us. Because now that we have three in the mix, he's the fastest. Because it's the superlative. So comparative is with two. Superlative is with more than two. Three or more. And these are common errors that you'll hear. Uh, you know where you hear these errors the most? I'm telling you, you hear them on TV. You know where you hear it the most? Unfortunately, it's um, uh, sports announcers in the broadcast booth. I mean, I've, I've watched a tremendous uh, devolution of the English language and really, more than any place, it's found in, in sports commentators. And, and the reason is, it's the pool that they grab from. I mean, what usually happens, look, years ago, to be a sports commentator, you had to have gone to school and learn broadcasting and studied English, like, like Brother Pat here, and, and had somewhat of a facile command of the language, even the ability to articulate and good dictation and proper pronunciation and all those things. But then what happened is they realized, hey, these athletes are popular. When they retire, let's put them in the broadcast booth. <laughs> well, I heard one of them speaking today on, on one of those call-in radio shows, and I had in the background, and, and the guy was admitting he's an ex-NBA player. He's going, we, we be not educated. I mean, and, and he's right. And I mean, I mean, they went to college, but they didn't study when they went to college. All they did was play sports. And so you, you have a, a, like a rudimentary street level language that's being spoken. And, and they, they mix the superlatives. They mix the comparatives. They mix adjectives and adverbs. They, they get words out of position. They say things wrong. And the problem is we hear it over and over and over. And our ear begins to gravitate. And I pray the Lord will give you a Teflon ear for bad speech. You know, and it won't stick as opposed to those old uh, steel pans, everything stuck to them. You, you want one of those anodized pan ears that doesn't, nothing catches to it. And, and, and what you want to do, again, to improve uh, your, your understanding of good English, is you need to read books from years ago. I only recommend Charles Haddon Spurgeon. You read them? Well, you ought to. I mean, it's time to, to grow up a little bit. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan. Have you read any of his stuff? Well, you ought to. Uh, uh, let me think. Um, Matthew Henry. Have you read any of his work? That, that's good. You ought to read some of that. Um, <coughs> Arthur Pink. Pink. Who else? The doctor. Dr. Ruckman. No, no. No, no. I like Dr. Ruckman. No, no. no, no you want to go back a ways. You want to go back about a century and a half. And, and, and those men were, they didn't grow up with sports announcers and radios and TV, so, so their ears weren't destroyed. I mean, these were men of letters that had read properly and were trained properly back when a college really was a college and a school really was a school, not like it is today. And uh, those are good books to read. And, and read out loud sometimes. Now, the best of all is the Bible. But if you want to get some, some English... That, that's a proper English. That If it's not the King's English, it's a Elizabethan Queen's English, good English. Then you want to read those things. And that will help you. <coughs> okay. To form the superlative, again, go to Hebrews uh, 8 and Hebrews chapter 7. We'll look at two examples there. I do try to speak well before you. And, and I may fall and stumble sometimes, and Lord forgive me, and I hope at that time you have a Teflon ear. And, and do correct me. I don't mind being corrected when I've made a grammatical error, because I don't want to propagate this error over and over. There are children listening, and uh, I'd like them to learn English properly. Hebrews chapter 8, and in the verse 11... 
And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. So looking at a large pool of, of hearers, and from the least educated or least reputable to the greatest in a large pool. Remember, this is superlative. We're dealing with more than two. It's the greatest. And there you see the, the word great, and you modify it to the superlative by adding EST. But now, if you go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse uh, 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Most High. Not more High. This is of anything you can imagine. He is the Most High. And so, you modify the, the High by saying the Most High. And I, I told you, sometimes you'll put Most before the adjective. I guess you could have said the Highest. But that's just a phrase that they use, the most high. Now, I'll give you an exercise. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and let's see if we can pull some of these adjectives out as we read through them. Let's see if you can identify them. In that one verse when it said from the least, yes. would least be the positive state? Or would that, no, no that, that would be the superlative to the minor degree. You know, he is less than someone else. He is the least in that group. It's almost like an EST. Yes. Because we were, we were looking at the comparative and superlative, uh, and, I, and I maybe did it wrong in that I was only showing you the greater of the two, but whenever you're comparing, yes, one is greater and one is less than the other. One is the greatest and one is the least. And so, so you see the, how the up and down it goes both ways in the comparison. And we just, we're pro, our proclivity is to go to the higher one and, and pick the, the greater in the comparative and the greatest in the superlative. But there is a lesser and there is the least. And so those are just things to, to consider. So, so you'll find adjectives go both ways in modifying up and down. Just like there's a heaven, there's a hell. There's an up, there's a down. Adjectives go both way. There'll be the, the, there'll be the antonym. There'll be an antonym that goes in the opposite direction of, of the one that goes in the positive direction. That's where a thesaurus comes in handy. Anybody use a thesaurus? I, I, I'll tell you, they're, they're helpful for writing, but you know where they're really helpful for someone such as I, who's not linguistically gifted, you know, <laughs> is is when I'm trying to um, take a sermon and trying to divide it into four or five uh, topics. And then what I want to do is I would like to alliterate it for simplicity's sake. And I find a theme here and a theme here. And I go, boy, how can I state those themes where they have the same first letter beginning? So, And then I have to go to my thesaurus to pick it out because I'm just not gifted in my mind quickly to find all those synonyms. And the thesaurus helps me. So like yesterday when I was teaching a, a Psalm 50. And, and uh, what did I see? First, the court was summoned. You know, C, S. And then, and then the character of the sacrifice. C and S, and then and then the uh, the call to the sinner, and and then consider salvation. And you know you're trying to work through with the ways that it, it takes work for me. <laughs> so so my thesaurus helps me with those synonyms there. And in there there's antonyms to the opposite, so that that may help you. And then again, you may not have to do this and just enjoy reading your Bible. But for those of you that will have to do it, this can be a help to you. Ecclesiastes chapter five. Starting with verse 8. Um, which would be the adjectives you would see in that verse 
and would they be in the positive, the comparative, or the superlative state? A couple jump out. All right, Did, does anybody see an adjective in there that would just be in its raw state in the positive base form? Any other? There you go. There's one. You see, there's a perverting of judgment that the Lord is seen. But he, he modifies and says it's violent perverting. It's not the most violent, which would be the superlative form of that adjective. It's just in its base state a violent perverting of judgment. And so there's the adjective in its base form, what we'll call the positive raw state, and it's modifying the type of perverting that's going on. It's a violent perverting. As opposed to, let's say, a subtle perverting. And that could happen too. A subtle perverting would be you know, we get together before it happens and say, look, we're going to fix this judgment. Here's a few bucks here. A violent perverting of judgment will be what's going on in Cairo right now in Egypt. I mean, they're perverting judgment with machetes and machine guns and throwing and breaking things. Okay, that's violent perverting. Um, again, uh, what else do you see? Any other adjectives in there in another form, in another state? Comparative higher and highest. There you go. Higher and highest. Uh, which which states are those? Comparative. The comparative. Which is the comparative? Higher. 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 Comparative will have the ER because it's comparing two things. And so, look at how he's saying it here. Um, marvel not okay, at the matter, for he that is higher... Than the highest. Now that's that's a real tricky way of writing. The Lord is, oh Lord, you could write this better. He really does keep us on our toes, doesn't he? But here's what he's saying. He's saying, if you take the best man down here, that's a judge, the highest man that's a judge, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> just joking. But but she is on the Supreme Court. Okay, so she'd be one of the highest uh, judges in our land. And uh, okay, bingo. And now and now. And now, the, the, who, is, who is the writer of Ecclesiastes referring to when he speaks of the higher? He's talking about God. He's talking about the Almighty. And so now you take the highest in the land and put them in the same room with God and compare those two. Guess who wins? God is higher than the highest. Tricky way of writing it. But, but you're correct. You, what you caught was... Am I... Am I Correct? Amen. Okay. And, and so, so, he that is higher than the highest. I'm talking about the Lord. And he's just looking in a, in a one-on-one, mano-a-mano standoff between the best you can find on planet Earth and Jesus Christ. And you get the best on planet Earth against Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is better than the best. No doubt with that, right? And so, what we're seeing here is we're seeing the comparative in the higher but then we're seeing the superlative in the highest. But of course, we understand, this is why it's a spiritual book, the highest is comparing to everyone else on planet Earth. And so you're getting the mortal versus the immortal. You're getting the earthly versus the eternal, the spiritual, the heavenly. And you see in quite an interesting way the Lord sets it up. Yes? Would you think that this goes like, he that is higher, that's Christ, and the highest, anybody on earth regard it, and there be higher the Father than they. Yeah. That, that, would, that would line up with uh, John uh, chapter 14, and what verse is that? Is it 20 or 30? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but yeah, that would be it. And that, that's... Uh, let me, yes, yes. John... Uh, One more time out loud for the tape. 1428. Yeah, my, my son was saying that 
that looking at the particular verse, he's saying, uh, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and I would assume that refers back, uh, that would be Jesus, okay? And there be higher than they, and that would be the Father in his office, higher than even Jesus, according to John 14, verse 28. But we didn't have to go there, but it's very nice to do those kinds of things, and we will when we teach them. But what I wanted you to take a look at right there in that particular verse was the different forms of the adjectives in their different states. And you had the raw, positive, uh, violent, just in its raw state right there, modifying the perverting. And then you had the comparative of higher, and then you had the superlative of highest. Now, if you back up to verse number 5, what can you find in that particular verse for an adjective? Amen, I hear. You're correct. Better. Better. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. And so now what, what he's doing, he's going to compare two things. Let's compare two things in your life. Here's, on one hand, you make a vow to God and you don't pay it. On the other hand, you never make a vow in the first place to God. Okay, okay. And, okay. On one hand, you get all stirred up during a preaching sermon. You run down to the altar and say, Lord, I'll be a missionary anywhere you want me to be. And, and, then, and then you get this tugging in your heart. I'd like you to be a missionary to Uganda. <laughs> and you think, wait a second, I don't like Uganda. I don't want to go there. Okay. So, Or on the other hand, during the same sermon, you get all stirred up and you don't go down to the front. And you, go, you know what's better? Stay in your seat. Stay, stay in your seat. Discretion. Wisdom. It's better than valor and false bravado. And so, and so, these are things to consider. Look, this is serious business. And now in the comparison, he's making a comparative here. One's better than the other. And he just showed you what's better. I think, I, you know, by the way, I think, I think young Christians sometimes do goofy things like that. <laughs> I, think, I think maybe the Lord is a little bit tender-hearted, you know, like a child. You know, a three-year-old running and volunteering to do something they can't possibly do. And I think the Lord, Jesus may say, forgive them, Father. They're not, they don't even know what they're asking. You know, but there comes a point then where the Lord, you know, wants to get serious with you. You're, you're growing up enough to make a decision. But even then, the verse just told you, it's a better not to vow rather than to vow and not pay. And so there's a comparative and there's a lesson. Now go to verse 1. Same chapter. What are the adjectives there? Yeah. I'm ready to hear. I'm more ready to hear. And and here is again he's comparing do I want to on one hand give a sacrifice or on the other hand do I want to hear? And he's saying the better thing to do when you come to the house of God is be more ready to hear than to give a sacrifice. It is very interesting. This will really kill a lot of tithe preachers out there <laughs> because they think the most important thing to do is come to the house of God and give money. But you know what? The Lord would rather have you in the house of God hearing the Word of God than getting money out of you. Because you need His Word more than He needs your money. That will destroy this ministry. We'll never get on TCT. But, but this is just the reality. 
You see, it's more what God wants to do in and through and to you than what you're going to do for Him in throwing some of your hard-earned money in the plate. And so in a comparative, this is really, this is good stuff. I may use this on Ask the Pastor Wednesday because I'm going to be on. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be on Wednesday. They just, I'm hoping the snowstorm, they said the snowstorm might stop us. So I'm hoping for a cancellation. We're praying for a good snowstorm. But if I get in there and tithing comes up, we may use this first. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, by the way, they, they have asked me a number of times when I'm there. Would you please do like a 30 second spot to, you know, pitch money for? You know, they're always asking. You know, please. Uh, I'm Pastor Michael C. from Grace and Truth Church. I hope you're enjoying this ministry here. Why don't you give a few dollars to TCT? I slip out the door every time. I disappear. I'm not going to get up there and do that. I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask. I don't ask money for this church, and this is what God is doing. I'm going to ask money for a TV station. And I told them, I'm, I'm willing at any time to get up there and to give a one-minute exhortation for God's people to live right or do right or read their Bible. But I'm not going to get up there and do anything like that. Now, okay, so we see now. Adjectives. They'll, they'll take a noun or a pronoun, and they'll describe that noun, the Almighty God. Or they'll modify that noun, it is a great sacrifice. Okay, They'll modify the noun. They'll usually be placed before the noun, but sometimes they'll be placed after the noun. Uh, Rachel, rather than saying the beautiful Rachel, you'll say Rachel was beautiful, and you'll put the a modifying adjective after by a linking verb most times. But just pay attention around a noun and see if God is trying to modify or describe that in a different way to see how He wants to look at that noun so you see it through His eyes. And, and with the noun, sometimes the Lord will go beyond just the raw state. He'll make it comparative or when He's really pleased, superlative. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I mean, and, and, he, and put the superlative to it, to the utmost state. Now, exceptions. There are some adjectives in the Bible, and I, I listed the ones I, I could find there, that have only the positive state. They cannot show degrees of comparison. Complete. There is no completer or the completest. Equal. Excellent. Impossible. I mean, if, it's, if something's impossible, it's impossible. It's not more impossible. It may be more improbable, but it, it's either possible or it's not possible. Possible or impossible. Perfect. Supreme. Utter. Those are some adjectives that the Lord will use to alter a noun, but, but it's just in the raw state. There is no comparative or superlative. It is what it is. So there's just observations. Now, there's another grouping of words that kind of fits under the adjectives, and they're called articles. Uh, they're not technically, brother, they're not really adjectives, are they? But, but they actually, because, sometimes I think you should be teaching the course because he has a bachelor's in English. <laughs> but but they, they're like adjectives because they're associated with nouns and they come before nouns. So if you look at your sheet here, the three articles are a, an, and the. And they will identify a noun. If you ever doubt if a word is a noun, if you ever see one of those articles in front of it, it's a noun. I mean, uh, a car, the car. It, it describes it for you. Um, I, you can't put a or the or an in front of an adverb or a verb. So when you see a or the or an, it's, it's a noun you're dealing with. So that's one thing that helps you. Now, there are two types of articles. There's indefinite articles and there are definite articles. The indefinites always come before a singular noun. Remember, nouns can be in the singular or plural. I can have a car or many cars. There is the temple or unfortunately they built many temples. 
and and you can't have a temples or a cars. And so they'll always come before singular noun. They will refer indefinitely to a singular noun without specifying a particular therein. For example, go to Ezekiel chapter 1. And sometimes seeing it will help better than my definition. Ezekiel chapter 1, and let's say in verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of, here we go, a man. And the face of a lion on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox, indefinite, on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. And so there we see those indefinite articles. Now sometimes it's an A and sometimes it's an an. When do you use A? When do you use an? Uh, mostly we've been taught that you use an A if the next word begins with a consonant. And you use an if the next word begins with a vowel. And so you can see right here, um, lion begins with a consonant, so you use the indefinite article A. You don't say an lion, you say a lion. And, and of course, ox begins with the vowel O, so it's an ox. You wouldn't say a ox. And so, it's just a, a, an indefinite, indefinitely taking a singular noun without specific, specifying a particular in that group. So, uh, if I had a group of lions, I took a lion. Which one? I didn't tell you. I just took a lion. I chose an ox. Which one? I didn't tell you. I haven't described it. The biggest ox. Now all of a sudden I'm describing. It becomes a definite article instead of an indefinite article. And so that's why you see with the definite article, this is where you identify a particular noun within a group or a specific group. Like in Genesis, go back to uh, chapter 1 and then we'll look at chapter 2 in a few verses. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's a curious thing, and and the King's English is a little bit different than the than University English, but you're correct. Uh, and host, and I think I had that picked out in one one of the uh, examples. Maybe it was the Daniel eight twelve example. I forgot. <laughs> I'll check that while you're turning over to Genesis, Daniel eight twelve. Yeah, it's and host, Daniel eight twelve. That's one of those few example uh, exceptions where it, it, even though host begins with an H, it's an host. The Lord uses it that way. But, you know, Pastor, it's, um, I used to think that it was uh, the written vowel, but it's not the written. The sound, the sound. The sound. Right. Yeah, like so. so it's, if it's the vowel sound, it's an an. Yes. You don't look at if it's written A E I or U. Correct. Like, for example, the word university. You wouldn't say an university, you'd say a, a university. Right. And the reason is because it starts with you, ya, ya, which is not... Uh, it's, sometimes it's a little tricky, but it's, it's not the written vowel or consonant, but if, the, if, the, if it has the vowel sound... Oh, oh like umbrella? The consonant sound. That's right. That deter, it's the sound. Yeah, the sound, right. yeah. And I, I was always taught... You have to pronounce it. Yeah, and the, then, then your ear becomes your guide. Right. And when in doubt, look it up in a dictionary. <laughs> when you're not certain. And best of all, look it up in the Word of God. And however God uses it, I'll follow His example. Here in, in uh, Genesis, in, in the Brothers Correct there, uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness, uh, He called the darkness, He called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And so, so we have a, a definite article identifying within the group of days, this is the first day. He's identifying the day here. Now, if you go on to the second chapter, 
and look at verses 15 and 16. And the Lord God took the man, the man, not a man, the man. Which man? The one that he had just made earlier in that paragraph. The one he had taken out of the ground. Um, he took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden. Which garden? The garden of Eden. From the last one. So again, a definite article will identify a particular noun within a group or a specific particular group. Now, I don't know how much time we have left, but I wanted to show you, now that we've taken a look at, we've got the nouns and the pronouns. We've had our verbs. We've seen that we can, through something called adjectives, And they have their cousins, which are adverbs, which we'll look at a little bit next week. Nouns have their cousins. When you get these major groupings together, nouns, pronouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, you have the five working words that will make up 80% of your communication language skills. Those are the five major groups of words there. And... And these groupings of words will come together in word chunks that are phrases or clauses. And I wanted to show you these chunks of words, but I don't know where we are in time. We may be running out of time on the tape. So, yeah, okay, so we're 65 minutes in. We better not get into it tonight. We'll start looking at it next week. The concept of putting these groups of nouns and verbs and adjectives together into word chunks within sentences. The Lord will do it frequently where He'll use phrases and He'll use clauses. And Paul uses this style a lot in his writing. Uh, the psalmist uses this style. And, and so as we'll go through the Scriptures, we'll take a look at these large chunks of words that the Lord will put together. And sometimes He'll take an entire chunk of words, a phrase, and make an adjective out of it. Or take an entire chunk of words in a clause or a phrase and make a subject noun out of it. And the Lord does this thing and it's a very interesting and, and writers do it frequently too. So we'll look at that next week. So just to review tonight, adjectives are words that describe. They describe and they modify nouns, sometimes pronouns. They'll come either before or after, so pay attention. And they can be in the raw form or the comparative, that's two, or the superlative, that's three. Question? All right. Next week. Lord willing. Just to go ahead.